In Tokyo in the year 2000, an entire family was massacred by a single criminal wielding only a knife. That criminal then stayed in their home for quite some time after. But the question is, who was he? Let me start off by saying that when I make videos about Japanese cases, a lot of people ask me how I was able to learn a new language. Well, I learned through traditional means, but I also used various apps along the way. When it comes to language learning apps, Babbel is at the top of the game. One of the most important things when it comes to learning a language is conversation practice. When you're not in that country, it can be difficult to come across. Babbel helps by teaching through using real-life language and dialogue with lessons written by real-life teachers. After just three weeks, throughout these 10-15 to 15 minute lessons, you can already get started speaking your new language. University studies have shown that about 15 hours of Spanish Babbel courses are the equivalent to a semester of Spanish at a university. You can decide how you want to learn your language too by using podcasts, games, live classes, or even more. You can even do quick review activities throughout the day when you have a few free minutes to spare just to keep things fresh. Check out Babbel's offer in the description to get up to 65% off of your subscription. Shout out to Babbel for sponsoring this video. In Kamisoshigaya Sanchomei, the Setagaya ward in Tokyo, an average small nuclear family lived together in their modest home. The family consisted of the father, 44-year-old Mikio Miyazawa, his 41-year-old wife Yasuko, their daughter, 8-year-old Nina, and son, 6-year-old Rei. Mikio worked for a marketing agency and Yasuko was a teacher. Nina was a clever and active second grade girl and ballet dancer who was smart enough to skip a year in school. Ray had a mental disability, but his parents were there to provide support. They lived in a fairly spacious home in a nice area, right up against the Soshigaya Park, providing both a nice view and a great place for the kids to play. On December 31st, the final day of the year 2000, in fact, the family had gone out shopping together, came home, ate dinner, and watched some TV. However, at about 11.30 p.m., a stranger entered the home. A criminal, rather. The criminal entered, theoretically, from the window of the second floor bathroom in the back of the home. It is believed that he had climbed a tree and silently removed the screen from the window. Upstairs, the killer first ran into the son, Ray, as he slept in his room on the second floor. Coming across the young boy in his bed, he soon strangled him. It's likely that this wasn't completely silent. He caused somewhat of a disturbance as the father, Mikio, heard something and rushed up to Ray's room. An altercation occurred as he caught the killer in Ray's room. Not knowing that Ray had already been strangled, he fought the killer as well as he could. He was able to injure the man, leaving traces of his blood behind, but in the end, the killer gave up on using his fists and took out a sashimi knife, stabbing him repeatedly all in his arm, chest, face, and finally in the skull, ending the fight. He had stabbed him so deeply that a piece of the knife broke off inside of his brain. The killer soon came across the mother, Yasko, and the daughter, Nina, who had been woken up by this point. He began hitting them, hard enough to knock out several of Nina's teeth. The killer rushed into the kitchen, grabbed a traditional kitchen knife, and ran back to them. In this time, Yasko had tried to use some tissues to stop Nina's bleeding, and then attempted to take her and run down the stairs when the killer caught them. It appears that they weren't able to put up much of a fight, as he soon ended their lives as well, via both stabbing and striking them. He continued to stab them repeatedly, mainly in the face and neck area, long past the point of their lives being snuffed out. After doing the deed, the criminal remained in the house for quite some time, estimated to be anywhere from as little as two hours all the way up to ten hours. He made himself some barley tea, cut up some melon, and ate some ice cream from the freezer. He also took this chance to open one of the family's first aid kits, take out some bandages, and patch up his wounds that he sustained in the fight earlier on. He rummaged through the family's documents, pouring them out into the bathtub. He then hopped on the computer and played around for a while. He connected to the internet around 1 a.m. He made a random new folder and then looked at the website for a theater that Mikio had bookmarked. He then went and took a nap on the sofa. At some point during his stay, he made a big mistake by going into the family bathroom and taking a gigantic dump. 
without flushing. Maybe he thought this would add insult to injury, maybe he just didn't care, uh, who knows. He threw Mikio's wallet, house keys, and some of the documents he had gotten earlier into the toilet with it. Either way, with both this and all of the blood he left behind earlier, he had left behind a pretty good chunk of DNA. Yasuko's mother, Haruko, who lived in an attached property next door, got a little worried when she kept calling the home and couldn't get an answer. She didn't know that, at this point, the killer had removed the phone line. After waiting a while for a call back, she decided to walk over to the house and check things out in person. She buzzed their intercom multiple times, but obviously received no response. At around 10 a.m. in the morning, she decided to enter the home herself, and soon discovered an absolutely grisly scene that no family member, or human, rather, should ever have to experience. She first saw the father lying on the ground in front of the staircase, already succumbed to his knife wounds. She moved upstairs to find Yasuko and Nina. She desperately tried to find some trace of life still left in them, but unfortunately they were long gone. She went a little farther to find Ray in his bed, his life ended as well. Soaked in blood, she called the police. The Tokyo Metropolitan Police responded to the call and began their investigation immediately. The killer had left a pretty good slew of clues behind, including clothing, blood, feces, among others that we will get to later. The police were able to analyze all of these things and determine a few details about the killer's identity. First, they were able to determine that he had eaten some string beans and sesame seeds, which admittedly may have not been of much significance at first glance, but a clue is a clue. The killer also left a bit of clothing behind, his sweater and a fanny pack, along with his now broken sashimi knife, which the cops were able to find had been bought in Kanagawa, a prefecture just southwest of Tokyo. They were able to find that only 130 items of that particular sweater had been sold, and they were only able to track down 12 of the people who actually bought them, with none of them seeming to provide any leads. The fanny pack seemed to have had what appeared to be a few grains of sand inside, which were oddly to have found to be traced from the desert in California, namely near the Edwards Air Force Base. He had also left behind two black handkerchiefs that he had used to conceal the knife, which were said to reek of Drakkar Noir, of all things. Both the killer's fingerprints and DNA were obtained, but unfortunately neither of them had any hits with any sort of criminal database within Japan. They were able to figure out pretty early on that the blood type was A, meaning that it wasn't from any of the family members, at least. Police believed that the killer was thin, and roughly 170 centimeters tall, or about 5 foot 7, being that this would have been the size that his clothes and fanny pack would have fit. They believe he was born anywhere from 1965 to 1985, as they believe he was anywhere between 15 and 35 at the time of the incident. They feel that he would have had to be within this age range to both climb into the house and overpower the family inside. He had very short black hair, judging by hairs left behind in his fanny pack that were likely his own. He would have also been right-handed, something they were able to judge from the family's wounds. They were able to learn from the DNA that the killer was male and likely to be of mixed race, more specifically having a mother of Southern European descent, near the Mediterranean or Ariatic Sea, and a father of East Asian descent, most likely either Chinese or Korean. However, it is possible that the European DNA from his mother comes from a more distant ancestor, and that his mother wasn't fully European. She very well could have been from the same location as the father, meaning he still likely looked fully or mostly Asian in appearance. They were able to analyze his shoe prints and indicate that he had likely bought them while in South Korea, as they were manufactured there in a very specific size that wasn't sold in Japan. Particles of soil were found that ended up being from South Korea's Jeonggi province, which includes the area around Seoul, the capital. These discoveries had led the Tokyo police to determine that the killer may have not been of Japanese origin, which caused them to worry that he was quite possibly a foreigner and had even fled the country already. They came into contact with Interpol on the issue. This was possibly an international incident. Interpol gave the case top priority and put their best men on it. 72-year-old Takeshi Tsuchida, who was the lead investigator on the case at the time of the murders, is still haunted by what he saw. 
He has since retired from the police force, but he can't let this case go. He continues his work on the case in an unofficial capacity. He can't get the image of the victims' faces out of his mind. When you compare victims who die from illness or natural causes to those who are suddenly murdered, they look very different. They have furious facial expressions. They are mortified and regretful. I imagine that all of the victims felt the same way, just feeling regret, he said. Although he can't continue to officially work on the case with the current officers, he still distributes flyers and works to get new clues and information. And of course, theories have been formed in relation to who the killer may have been. The father of the family, Mikio, had been seen arguing with some skaters in the park adjacent to their home, complaining about their noise. The family had also filed noise complaints on the skaters as well to the police. Based on this and the attire of the killer, one of the main theories is that the killer had been a disgruntled skater. An investigative journalist named Fumia Ichihashi had been researching this case for years, along with many others. You could say that he's quite experienced researching this sort of thing. In 2015, he compiled all of the details of his personal investigation and released a book of his findings. His findings have been proven to be very popular among many crime enthusiasts. Up until this point, many had struggled to find any sort of motivation for the killings, aside from some circumstantial evidence here and there. Ichihashi asserts that money may have been the motive. Around the time of the killings, the park near the Miyazawa home was being expanded. The nearby homeowners were paid a substantial amount of money in compensation due to this, sometimes up to 100 million yen or around 900,000 US dollars. As the criminal left behind his knives, clothes, bag, fingerprints, palm prints, and footprints without care, I couldn't help but think that he was confident that he would not get caught, Ichihashi said. He believed that the police didn't send their A-team for the initial investigation, being that a lot of officers were already working on other cases and they were understaffed due to being New Year's Eve. On the contrary, Tsushida asserts that this claim is absolute bullshit. Take this all with a grain of salt because it's only coming from the man himself, but Ishihashi claims to have made contact with a South Korean man that he refers to as K. This K had spoken to the mother of the family, Yasko. Yasko had mentioned that the compensation payment for the park expansion would really help them out with caring for their son. K saw dollar signs and hired a hitman to eliminate the family and obtain the money. This hitman is referred to in the book simply as R who used to be a part of the South Korean military at some point, but had since turned killer for hire. Ichiyashi claims to have found and made contact with R. During this contact, he was able to obtain his fingerprint somehow, which he found to be a match for the killer. The Tokyo police didn't necessarily buy any of this, saying that the case would have been considered solved already if they had believed any of that to be the truth. Manubu Ide, the man now in charge of the case is confident that they will likely be able to solve it. He believes that the DNA they have will ultimately lead to an arrest. The paternal grandmother of the Miyazawa family, Setsuko, keeps a shrine to the family in her home. She still prays for the case to be solved. She was so traumatized by the case that she doesn't even remember going to the funeral. Detective Tsuchida still visits Setsuko to discuss the case and pay his respects to the victims. Above all, Setsuko just wants to know why it happened. More recently, during the pandemic, police have been taking the opportunity to pass out masks, including flyers asking for information on the case in the areas surrounding the home. By this point, the police think it's fine to finally tear down the house once and for all. The entire interior has been mapped out into a 3D model, and every little bit of evidence has already been collected. The house is getting old, and it still provides a grim reminder of what happened within. The other homes originally near the crime scene have long since been demolished. Over 246,000 investigators have worked on this case, accumulating over 12,500 pieces of evidence. By the year 2015, 40 officers were still assigned to the case full-time, and by 2019, 35 officers were confirmed to still be working on the case. By 2020, over 13,000 tips have been called into the department, with, obviously, no luck. There is still a $200,000 reward offered for any help in solving this case. 
Thank you again for watching my videos. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, if you don't mind, leaving a like really helps the video to get seen by others, and feel free to subscribe if you want to see more cases like this. If you'd like, I do have a Patreon, and you could support the channel on there. Speaking of which, a special shout out to my current top tier patrons. Lux Alpaca, Charity, Skooky Main, Foxlicity, Jackie, Lavenderwise, Brittany Marchbanks, and Toy King 10. I know I say it all the time, but you guys are the best. And once again, I'd like to give a shout out to Babel for sponsoring this video. Have a good night, and I'll see you next time.